Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the GAR Williams Endowed Lecture, Why Medicine and the World Needs Sparkles by Dr. Mm -hmm. Gale Rosso. I hope that I said it correctly. Before we start with the lecture, I would like to mention that the lecture is available for CME. So if you would like, please click the link in the chat and insert your first name, last name, email address, and credit claiming type in the Excel sheet, okay? And I would like to say a few words about the master. Um, if not. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. Remove like that. So, uh, about the Master of Sciences in Bioethics and Medical Humanities, we have two tracks the bioethic track that focuses on teaching, research, and service through hospital ethics committees and institutional review board service, teaching in all healthcare settings and conducting normative and empirical research in healthcare ethics issues. The another track is in the medical humanities, which focuses on teaching or research on those aspects of narrative, reflective writing, fine arts and history as applied to healthcare. So we have multiple ways that you can study with us if you're interested. Our program offers a two-year format. We also offer an accelerated one-year format where you can complete our MS program in one year. For students who are interested in dual degree, um, medical school and an MS, we have that option too. And then they end School of Medicine. Um, when they end the School of Medicine, they will have both an MD and an MS degree. If you do not want to complete MS in bioethics, we also offer three certificates in clinical ethics, research ethics, and medical humanities. So you can search us and you can look up at uh, tulane.edu slash bioethics. And if you have any questions, you can also contact Dr. Stefan Hanson and me. So now I would like to turn this to Isabella. And Nikki, we will introduce Dr. Russo. And I'm going to turn off. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Nikki Worth, and I am a third year medical student at Tulane. And me and Isabella um, decided to invite Dr. Russo to come talk to all of us today. We really were impressed with her uh, lecture earlier this year. And I thought it fell quite in line with a lot of the values that our program at the bioethics department um, you know, champions. So a little bit about our speaker today. Um, Dr. Rousseau is a co-founder and past president of the National Organization of Women, of Women in Neurosurgery, um, abbreviated WINS in the US and has been instrumental in the development of uh, WINS organizations around the world. She has been a leader in multiple international neurosurgical organizations, including the World Federation of Neurologic, uh, Neurosurgical Societies, WFNS, uh, the WFNS Foundation and the WHO WHO Liaison Committee. She has served in the leadership of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, AANS, as a member of the BOD and vice president. Um, she has served as the chair of Congress uh, of Neurological Surgeons, CNS, International Committee, awarding fellowships to young international neurosurgeons who have become leaders in their nations and regions. For nearly two decades, she's been a member of the board of directors of the Foundation for International Education in Neurosurgery, F-I-E-N-S. Mm. I'm gonna hand this over to Isabella. Yes, uh, she has published over hundred articles, has been the visiting professor at nearly 20 universities and has given hundreds of invited presentations around the world. She's on the editorial board for numerous uh, neurosurgical peer reviewed journals. And she's also elected to the board of directors and an executive committee of the G4 Alliance, where she works with leaders of other surgical organizations around the world to increase quality of surgery for patients everywhere. In 2021, last year, she was awarded the humanitarian award at the AANS. She completed her med school at George Washington University School of Medicine and did her residency in neurosurgery at George Washington. 
Following a fellowship in cranial base and microvascular surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, she returned to her native Midwest, practicing in Chicago for 25 years with the CINN Medical Group, with faculty appointments at Rush University and the University of Chicago. She then returned to Washington and was named Clinical Professor of Neurosurgery at George Washington in 2018. And for that, I would like to open up to Dr. Rousseau. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen and Isabella. It's a delight to be with all of you. Let me open up my slides here and, uh, and see if I can share and get started. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Yes, okay. Please let me know if we have any AV snafus along the way, but otherwise we'll get started. And I am really delighted both to be with all of you, as well as to have the honor of speaking to the program in medical ethics and human values, which really has done so much. And ethics and human values are at the, at the core of all we do in every medical discipline. So this is especially meaningful to me. So thank you for the honor of speaking with you. And we chose a talk to kind of whet your interest and appetite because I'll bet Nobody knows what a SPRACAR is, or they didn't before they looked it up uh, in response to this. I'm taking a word from my friend, um, and I will sprinkle a few comments about that throughout our talk on diversity, uh, because I think, uh, I think it's a useful word and a useful concept. So let's get started. Um, the secrets of the SPRACAR, and SPRACAR is an ancient Icelandic word for outstanding woman. So I would like to think that the group of women on the Zoom uh, webinar are SPRACAR. Isabel and Kristen are each a SPRACI. So a SPRACI is the singular, SPRACAR is the plural. And I would refer you to this book, which is working its way toward the New York Times bestseller list just out this year. Um, uh, Eliza Reed is the current first lady of Iceland, and this book talks about her country in particular, which has much to teach us, and her comments and interviews have much in general to inform our concepts about the value of diversity in the workplace. I'll come back to that again. I, I do refer you to her New York Times article earlier this year on this subject. So we published on this topic in uh, uh, World Neurosurgery in 2020 and since have had book chapters and uh, as Kristen said, over uh, 20 visiting professor talks just on this topic alone. So it's clearly a topic whose time has come and that have people uh, interested in. So let's start out with something that we can all agree on. I, of course, my perspective is going to be from neurosurgery, but insert uh, wherever I speak about neurosurgery, insert your own medical discipline because this applies to us all, right? But those of us who are in neurosurgery uh, believe that we want the, to attract the best possible people to our discipline. I'm sure you do too. And uh, I do believe that the evidence shows that a key driver of excellence and innovation in any field, certainly in mine, is diversification. And that's what this talk will be about, is presenting the evidence that diversification drives excellence. So here's my outline, four areas that I'd like to go over with you, how diversity is viewed in academic neurosurgery, uh, some of the diversity issues we've tackled as a profession, some of the things we've learned from other professions about uh, the benefits of diversity and how to diversify, and then some things we've learned from other areas in general, economic and ecological perspectives. So the first thing is here, here we're at Tulane, one of the nation's uh, preeminent academic institutions, and I'm sure anyone on the faculty would agree that the, the NIH is an important part of being able to create an academic career in any medical profession. And therefore, it's important to know that the NIH takes diversity seriously. Let me just share a few of the more colorful screenshots from their webpage, but NIH is not only studying the scientific areas that have piqued our individual curiosities, 
but it also looks at the science of diversity, looking at uh, funding research and issues such as implicit bio, uh, bias, uh, stereotype threats, institutional prestige bias, um, how we can, how they can partner to broaden participation, addressing career transition gaps and mitigating the obstacles to having our goal, which is to have an equal uh, representation within any medical specialty uh, to that, the representation of that minority group within our population. So NIH takes it seriously and we should too. Now, let me just share with you what I know best, which is my own specialty. So we'll talk a little bit about neurosurgery, but again, think about how it applies to your own field. So uh, as you can see, it is a true statement that from the very beginning, neurosur or organized neurosurgery included women. This is a photograph of the first a gathering of what became the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. And you can see from the very beginning, there was a woman there. Um, Dr. Louise Eisenhardt is well known and well respected by everyone in our field. She was not a neurosurgeon, but a neuropathologist, worked a hand in glove with Harvey Cushing. She became the first woman president of the AANS and was the first editor in chief of our journal. So very well respected and she was there, but you can see she was not a neurosurgeon. Uh, gender diversity did come in our field and is continuing to arrive, but slowly Diana Beck and Sophia Ionescu in Europe were general surgeons like Harvey Cushing was, but who increasingly devoted their practice to neurological surgery. But it was not until 1959 that the world had its first woman who was board certified in uh, neurosurgery, and that was Professor Altanak in Turkey. Two years later, I'm proud to say uh, Ruth Kerr Jacoby from my own institution was board certified, the first woman to be so certified in the United States. And sadly, Dr. Jacoby just passed within the last six weeks or so, but a real uh, legend in our time and a, a mentor for many. And then gender diversity spread across the globe with the first board certified Asian neurosurgeon in 1968. The first board certified woman in Africa wasn't until 1994 and is still, as you can imagine, still actively practicing. Look at the difference uh, in, as we look at compound minorities, right? Intersectionality. Look at the difference between the last slide and this one. Ruth Kerr Jacoby, a white female neurosurgeon, was the first in 1961. But look, it took 23 years later to have the first uh, woman who was also African American board certified. So we'll say a thing or two about that intersectionality. But by 1989, we had this youthful looking group, and you can see that kid in the front row in the black dress is me. And it may be hard to imagine, but I'm sharing with you the institutional memory of our women in neurosurgery group. Uh, this, this was a photograph taken at a meeting within my lifetime. I was there as a resident in 1989, and this gathering happened because for the first time at a neurosurgery meeting in the United States, a woman saw another woman at the meeting, and then that one saw another one. And so everyone who was at that meeting, which had about 2,500 neurosurgeons, got together and, and this is the photograph. So when, when pe people get discouraged that we're not making progress, remember this picture. Progress may not be as fast as we'd like it to be, but it is happening. So that was 1989. And again, not exactly a rocketing kind of uh, speedy transition, but by 2008, the board of directors of our specialty had noticed that there was an increasing number of women and wanted to address it formally. And therefore the, the board of directors uh, asked for a white paper on the recruitment and, attention, and retention of women in neurosurgery. And that was the first time there was ever any paper of this type uh, written in our field. So if we look a little bit at what, what that 
paper addressed and this paper then another 20 years later showed is that that white paper, which was a call to action in 20, uh, 2008, led to an increase of, uh, that you can see in uh, women neurosurgeons but it was not a rapid increase. So you can see that in 1980, 40 years ago, 4.7% of certified practicing neurosurgeons were women. And um, that had only increased to 6% by 2020. And yet our goal by that time as written in the call to action was 20%. So we were, we were falling off our projected goal. Uh, uh, and if you can take a look here, only 4% of all neurosurgeons in the US in 2020 were black or of African origin. And then here's that comment about and data about intersectionality. If you're black and a woman, it's less than 1% of neurosurgeons, 0.6%. So we have some work to do. Um, so those who are in academics, who tend to be the more visible people uh, within a profession are familiar with these data. Uh, this is data specific to neurosurgery, but I'm willing to bet that in any discipline, you could see similar kinds of numbers. And that is that increasing numbers, women are gaining uh, entry level positions into the field of academic neurosurgery, but are not getting to the full professor level and that needs to be addressed. And then increasingly, I don't need to tell med students this, but quite often male med students are marrying female med students, right? Or um, we have partners in same-sex couples where you're both physicians and no one wants to see the female or minority member of that couple having a pay differential just because uh, of their, their gender, their minority status. So that remains to be corrected. Again, all data show it's moving in the right direction, but may need a little nudge with policy. So in Europe, um, much more recently, just to show how, how things are moving in the right direction, but again, not as quickly as we would like, as you saw in 1989, American women formed that group that uh, Kristen mentioned called Women in Neurosurgery. It was not until this year that the first Australian group of women ever met, so in 2022. And in Europe, there was a task force of diversity uh, in neurosurgery started three years ago. And just this year, the task force became a full committee. And with committee status in most organizations, you have staff support, you likely have some funding support and uh, can make more rapid progress. So you can see that things are moving in the right direction, but it takes people working together and just waiting for change to happen is incredibly slow. Well, some happy things came about as a result of the COVID pandemic when we neurosurgeons, like many of you, started uh, meeting increasingly often online in order to, uh, to stay connected when we couldn't travel. And the period of the pandemic, which started in 2019, coincided with the 100th anniversary of neurosurgery as a distinct discipline. So we wrote a series of papers about 100 years of neurosurgery, looking back and looking forward at that sort of round number uh, anniversary. And this is the paper that really took off the contributions of American women. And most of them had been in the, 20, uh, the last 20 years of the first century, as, as you can imagine. But that concept uh, kind of lit the world and was the shot heard around the world. And so quickly during COVID, we developed writing groups of women neurosurgeons on all five continents. And uh, we were spurred on by this uh, nice commentary published in 2011 
by uh, Dr. Robert Spetzler, who's a very well-known leader in neurosurgery, who, who said as far back as 2011 that the scant historical literature devoted to women in the field of neurosurgery suggests not that their contributions are less worthy than those of their male counterparts, as much as that their contributions have yet to be fully recounted. So during the COVID pandemic, we had the opportunity to right that wrong and to fully recount our history. And I'm very happy to tell you that now a dozen papers have been published in peer reviewed journals and you can look up the history of women neurosurgeons in any country. Canada is in press, but otherwise they're all published. And so, um, we now have, have the opportunity to build on our history. So what can we say, what can we sprack or say about this? Well, um, the story of Eliza Reed um, is quite interesting because she, for, from a number of perspectives, she is the first lady of Iceland, but she's actually Canadian uh, by nationality, and she's also a professional journalist. So her book is about why this tiny nation is able to lead the charge in gender equality. It's kind of like um, the moment of lift that was written by Melinda Gates, but it shows not the uh, perspective from an opportune moment in time, but rather how a combination of heritage and some specific policy can make a difference. And I'll, I'll refer to this uh, again in a few minutes, but the perspective of the outsider as well as insider is one that I would ask you to retain because that's a unique perspective that you, if you are a minority in your specialty, whether as a woman or someone of color or someone of a different race or religion or, or sexual preference, you, you may be able to provide a more astute and acute outsider, insider vantage point that would be very useful for your profession. So let me move from the point of view of uh, women being a minority in my specialty to racial minorities in the specialty. And uh, without positive dissemination of the uh, extremely important mem mentorship provided by Latunde Odeku, no one would know about his contributions, but he's been a poet and really an inspirational mentor to many, many American neurosurgeons. He was born in Nigeria, came to the United States where he trained at the University of Michigan. And he was board certified, as you can see in this very same year that Ruth Kerr Jacoby was the first woman uh, to be board certified in the United States. He's a poet. That's actually a copy of his uh, book of, po one of his two books called uh, Twilight that's uh, on my bedside stand. Other racial diversities. We have my good friend, Linda Liao, who was born in Taiwan. Um, and came to this country like Dr. Adeko is an immigrant and yet has been an outstanding neurosurgeon and uh, chairman of a department of neurosurgery at UCLA. And she's even uh, has been inducted to the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, we recently published in our peer reviewed literature, uh, the story of her extraordinary trajectory, which is called the resiliency of a perpetual optimist. And she is a great example of having, um, despite many difficulties in language and socioeconomic status, um, you know, all the, the, in gender, about all the things you can say that would not make it easy for her to thrive in neurosurgery. And yet she did, and she credits her um, continual optimism with doing that. And um, it's worth a read. So I'm a devotee of Steven Pinker. I think he has a lot to say about uh, our society. And he his commentary on human diversity that speaks, I think, to neurosurgery is that equality is not the claim that groups of humans are interchangeable, 
but it's the moral principle that individuals should not be judged or constrained by the average properties of that group. So I don't think, for instance, as a woman neurosurgeon that I need to have everything exactly the same as make my male colleagues, but it needs to be equal. So sometimes that relates to what kind of changing room I have or the availability of scrubs. Sometimes it has to do with having step up so I can get to the level of the table because I'm shorter than male colleagues. I may not want it to be exactly the same because it may be harder for me to operate if it's exactly the same, but I want it to be equal. And I think that's what we all want. I think we also need to talk more about gender minorities. Uh, this is something that is important in every field and we need to be sensitive and open about that and, and create a place for everyone. I am increasingly aware of the immigrants and geographic transplants to our discipline. And here I, I give just three examples of people who are born in Turkey, Mexico, and Germany who are absolute leaders in American neurosurgery. And I think it's important for us to recognize that it may be that there is something about the process of having your um, skills sharpened and your resilience um, enhanced by being an immigrant that makes you even better suited to be able to thrive in challenging professions than if you weren't an immigrant. We're actually collecting some data on that. And then finally, what about uh, neurosurgeons with living with a disability. Now, I was just recently um, a guest of the Australian Society, and um, I was so interested in this public commentary by fellow neurosurgeon Michael Biggs, who's one of the leading cerebrovascular surgeons of our era, who was generous enough to share this comment that was told to him when he was a first year neurosurgical trainee in 1988. And that was, you're gonna to have to find something else to do because you have a stutter. And how could you possibly be a neurosurgeon if you have a stutter? Well, we now know, how could that possibly make any difference to anybody, right? Stuttering doesn't affect your ability to make good surgical decisions or to perform safe operations, but isn't it, interesting and, and in fact somewhat tragic that that recently that is something that someone could advise a young eager and obviously brilliant first year resident and get away with it well and then um i just we're talking to a a youthful group uh so this may be not as as relevant to you but i will tell you it's relevant to to me and an increasing number of your mentors, because I think we have a responsibility to recognize that we're now in the first generation in the history of the world that is likely to be finishing the main part of our careers, if we say it ends in most professions at 65. And yet we know that we are more likely than not to have more than 15 years of healthy life ahead of us. And in the case of medicine, at least American medicine, have uh, most would in that age bracket would have some financial security. So what are we doing with these additional years of healthy life and relative financial ease to bring more training or more access to care to more people. So that's something we're working quite diligently on in, in global neurosurgery. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. What can we learn from other professions? And um, let me just quickly go through this. Um, FDR is one of my heroes. And I love this quotation from him. It could be written today, right? And yet it was 1943 where he said, today science has brought together all the different quarters of the globe so close together that it is impossible to isolate one from another. Today we are faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all people of all kinds to live together and work together 
in the same world and at peace. Couldn't that have been said this morning by a world leader? This is way before the internet, but then FDR was ahead of his time. He tragically died in office, but his wish to integrate the armed forces was carried out by his successor, President Truman, in 1948. And I bring this uh, as an example, because sometimes diversity needs a little push. This is where policy uh, is important to move along that natural history, which we said does tend to move in the positive direction, right? The arc of human history is long, but it bends toward justice. This, that famous quotation from Martin Luther King, it does bend toward justice, but sometimes it feels like you can hardly see the bend. And so sometimes we need a high level political commitment. So in the case of diversification, and I mean racial diversification of the military, it took an executive order of the president and it also required long-term policy commitment with institutional oversight. So the United States Marine Corps has an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. The United States Army has an, a diversity roadmap. And if they didn't, they would have to have it because Congress provides the oversight for them. And so sometimes this is necessary. And that's just the best, most successful example of policy really changing uh, the way we do things. There's, the military still has a long way to go in terms of bringing peop, uh, women, people of color, and other uh, diversity uh, groups who are in a minority into leadership positions. But in terms of rank and file, minorities are even overrepresented compared with the general population. Well, what, what about business? So let what we've been talking about so far has to do with science and wanting to be sure the best science in medicine is available by bringing the, the best people forward. And we've talked about um, gender and we've talked about race, but let's put on the hat of business colleagues. And let's say you don't even care about moral uh, imperatives. It's your, your job to increase shareholder value. And that's your bottom line. It's not a, a moral or ethical bottom line, but even there, the evidence is overwhelming that diversity improves performance, it improves creativity and innovation, it increases competitiveness and improves relationships. I recommend another book to you that I think is extraordinary. This is part of the series of Harvard Business Review's Best Reads. And this is you know, uh, a group that takes the bottom line seriously. And these are their 10 best papers published in Harvard Business Review on how diversity increases the bottom line. But I'll just share with you from one of those articles. Uh, this is from Boston Consulting Group, but if you look up Bain, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, McKinsey, they all have the same data. And that shows that companies with more diverse leadership teams report higher revenues. So if you look at uh, the diversity scores among the leadership of companies, those that have high level diversity scores, actually just above average, have a 45% average increase in reported revenues compared with those who don't. There seems to be something about identical group think that actually lowers the bottom line. And there are many examples of that, but for the sake of time, let me just go on to economics here where, you know, anyone who has a portfolio, however modest and like mine is, but it, we know that it's important to diversify your portfolio, but we may not realize that that was as recently as 1990, uh, a theory that was so important and so um, innovative that it won Harry Markowitz a Nobel prize. Can you imagine for, uh, the economic theory of portfolio diversification, which was just simply the more types of investments you have, the more likely you are to have a net gain with lower risk. And that uh, that's uh, now established fact. Now, if you look at 
the upper left on your screen here, you see that the major proponents of portfolio diversification in the 20th century, so I've put them all in black and white pictures, are people like Harry Markowitz. And you can see they were all older white guys. But look at uh, the 21st century and what the experts in economics look like who are proponents of portfolio diversification. You can see uh, I've put them in color, but they are in color. So you can see the diversity of gender and skin tone. So I think that that is a real finding and certainly the Nobel Prize Committee thought so as well. Well, finally, as we wrap, what about you know ecology in general, our, our world and the life upon it in general? Let's ask ourselves this question. Is it merely chance that there are estimated to be you know, 5.3 million species of life on earth or is there perhaps some Darwinian advantage conveyed, uh, conferred to nature herself by the presence of such diversity? And um, again, there are so many peer reviewed studies. I don't have time to go into all of them, but to summarize biodiversity, always in, improves the average level of a performance system, whether you're speaking about the rainforest or a coral reef, it enhances the productivity and stability of a system, uh, and biodiversity improves resilience to negative change and lowers the risk of negative outcomes anytime a system is threatened. So if we pull together the things we've been thinking about together here today, economics, I think has shown us that diversification increases the likelihood of positive gains and lowers risk. And ecology has done the same. So if we go back to that first consensus statement that we had that we needed the best possible people in our own given field, then I think the, uh, the evidence shows not just that it's a nice thing to do, but that the evidence shows that excellence, innovation, and strength are greatest if we diversify. And with that, I'd like to thank the very diverse team that worked with me on the initial publication, the chapters who've been with me as we continue to study this together. You can see it's a diverse team and I respect and appreciate every one of them. And then I also wanna share that this unity and diversity flag I'm using with permission from my friend Javier Yep, who is a Peruvian student who got a master's in graphic design uh, at a uh, university in the United States. And I love this unity and diversity flag, which he allows me to use with permission at uh, any talk that speaks about diversity. And then let's wrap with Eliza Reed. So why uh, does, Iceland so consistently rates so highly uh, in, uh, in gender equity. If you look at World Economic Forum, for instance, they have grading scales. There's a couple other global grading scales on diversity. And for the last dozen years in a row, Iceland has been number one. And this book shares some insights. I think it's not only the Sprakar, which, which comes from their tradition of you know, Viking and, and Nordic strong women, you know, the Helgas and the Olgas of, of Norse and Nordic legend, but that is part of the culture as well. The, the um, acceptance of individual and uh, physically and mentally and emotionally strong women. But in addition to that, there have been direct policy uh, changes that have been brought into play by the government of Iceland that institutionalize things that just make it easier for men and women in society uh, when a level playing field is established uh, for women and especially for mothers and families. So with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, the opportunity to be with you and maybe I'll stop sharing and see if we can uh, uh, have a little Q&A. Oop, that's a tr tribute to my friend who you probably don't know. Oh, let's see, let me stop sharing. Here we go, okay.
Back to you, Kristen and Isabella. Yes, so if you have any questions, you can post them in chat or just raise your hand and Isabella and, and Nikki will lead these questions. All right, Vid, go ahead and ask. Hi, Dr. Rousseau, um, my name's Vid. Um, Hi, thank you so much for such an amazing talk. Uh, I had a couple questions. So regarding the low percentage of women who are in the field of neurosurgery, I was wondering if you could shed some light on like why you might think that is, would it be, um, I know Dr. Dumont had mentioned in a talk earlier last week um, that neurosurgery's residency is the longest one out of all of them. Um, so could there be any, um, or could it be that, you know, women who are interested in uh, you know, having a family or work-life balance, could that be an impediment um, in deciding to um, go into neurosurgery as well as, you know, what are your recommendations or if you could give any insight on um, how to navigate family planning if you're interested in neurosurgery? Yes. yes, that's a great question. And actually, I don't need to give an opinion because I can give data. And this has been pretty well studied by me and others, and, and we published on this. The, the curious article that was published in 2020 addressed that um, in response to uh, some of the earlier questions that we raised about not only women not getting into neurosurgery, but also not being able to stay in. So you, you really have um, a couple break points, right? Or narrow points, what they call the, the, the leaky pipeline. So if on average 60% of med school classes are women, then many of the best and brightest, probably 60% are, are, are going to be women. So we should be looking to have many of them go into neurosurgery. And yet what we know is that only about 20% of the applicant pool it, for neurosurgical residency is women. So what is it we examine? Well, well, what causes the leak at that level? And you're absolutely right. It's a very long residency, the longest, and it also coincides with childbearing years. So that makes it particularly problematic. Um, but there are other fields like OBGYN that maybe are not nearly as long, but they're 80% women. So we knew that there was something about the culture of neurosurgery that was also uh, turning women away. And there's active groups working on changing the culture of neurosurgery. And I think it's been fairly successful so that now what we're seeing is that um, the, the numbers of women who are then being accepted into programs are roughly on par with the number who are applying. So it's not 60%, there's self-selection before, uh, but it's about 20%. And then the other issue had to do with retaining women in neurosurgery. And again, there are committees at the student, resident, and faculty level that are actively looking at, well, what are the barriers to keeping women in neurosurgery? Why would you finish a residency and then not get your boards or not continue to practice? So there are, there are data about that that we are addressing. And, and I can give a couple examples of, of things that have been done that have changed, you know, policies that have changed. So for one is there's a national policy for paternity as well as maternity leave that are equivalent. So that makes a big difference and gets around that biological clock. Then at the other end of that long residency, there used to be a period of time where you had to get your boards within five years, but many women, and you have to do a certain number of cases within those five years to get your boards. And many women were waiting until they were done with their that long residency in order to have children. And then that was interfering again there. So we've prolonged that, uh, that period as well. So you can take a little longer to get your, boards, uh, your board certification after residency. So, so these are the kind of things that uh, we're doing on, uh, on a uh, organized neurosurgery basis and on a departmental basis that are making a difference? Good question. 
Thank you so much. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, this has been a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, one, as far as policy, you said there were several things that we should be doing to kind of address the pay gap and the gender gaps that we see. Are there things we can be doing now as like med students or um, potential young neurosurgeons um, to kind of work towards pushing that along a little faster? And then the second question is, as somebody who um, is a young woman looking at neurosurgery residencies, what are the things that you would advise looking for or asking um, while you're doing away rotations or going through like the match process and interviewing those kinds of things that you would recommend kind of paying particular attention to, I guess? Yeah, well, the, one of the things to keep in mind uh, when one is a member of a minority and you know you and i are members of a minority of women who are interested in surgery but i want this to speak to people who are in other minority groups as well racial religious uh, you know gender preference etc um, what we know about group psychology is that until that minority represents about 15 percent of the group that all of one's efforts and activities are viewed as individual and one-off. So it's hard to gain momentum. That's why groups like women in neurosurgery have been successful because you're, even though we are almost always still the only woman in our department, but we're, we're a bigger group and a visible group. And that allows want to be able to make a difference. And uh, so I would work through the organizations that now do have a place at the table. So for, there's the, you know, AMWA, the American Medical Women's Association, there's um, the, uh, there's a similar group for um, the American Association of Women Surgeons. Uh, the AMA has a women's task force. There's a diversity, equity, and inclusion group uh, that includes med students and residents of both of our two national neurosurgical organizations, the AANS and the CNS. So uh, I think that the most effective way of affecting change is to work within the system um, Sometimes you need to carry banners and boycott and so forth, but but at least we're living in a time where there are vehicles that are addressing this issue. And so working within these established system, I have found for me works has been very successful. And then Dr. Malhotra, you have a question? Yes, hi, Dr. Rousseau. Thank you so much for this great presentation. And um, I'm also Pitt alumni, so go Pitt. Um, oh, go Pitt, that's right. Um, I, you know, your your presentation is intriguing to me because, you know, there, there's so much intersectionality and yet there's not intersectionality with certain groups. And so I guess from your perspective, as someone who has been doing this work, how do you promote, especially white women, and I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't make this assumption that you identify as a white woman, yeah. also then advocate for their colleagues, especially other women of color, because as we know, women of color, especially our black women colleagues are the least represented in medicine um, and in positions of power and privilege. And um, you know, I know this is a, a hot button topic, and yet um, I think sometimes the gender equity struggle gets very much confused with the racial equity struggle. And how do we give them both um, clout and yet also put weight where um, there, where there's still a lot of disadvantage and and uh, marginalization? Yeah. You know, Sonia, that is a really good question. And it's one that I personally have spent a lot of time thinking uh, about and actually working with them. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just share with you uh, a conversation that I've had within the last year at a women in neurosurgery meeting where a dear friend who's a neurosurgeon in a wheelchair made the statement, uh, I've been a disabled neurosurgeon and a woman neurosurgeon, and it's a lot harder to be a woman neurosurgeon than a disabled one, which was an eye-opener for all of us. And to that, the African-American 
woman neurosurgeon said, I've been a woman neurosurgeon and a black neurosurgeon, and it's a lot harder to be a black neurosurgeon. So, you know, it's very interesting to, uh, and helpful, I think, to share our candid impressions of, of what are the, what are the barriers and what are the biggest barriers? Um, and so that's something that, that needs to be addressed and, and is being addressed. Um, we just set up, uh, spent a year chairing a faculty committee on a, um, at GW, at, a, uh, the GW, um, equity Institute. And we talked a lot about gender equity versus racial equity, should it include all, or if we include all equities, do those that maybe have the most need or face the most injustice um, get, get put on a level playing field where they really need to have a little bit more affirmative action in terms of our attention to their issues. And that's something that we talk about at every meeting. Um, I think it, it it's going to be an ongoing conversation, but I think it's a very important one and one that I'm really sensitive to. Uh, I would be happy to continue the conversation with you offline. It's uh, I've spent you know hundreds of hours and um, have done a lot of reading and you know been an autodidact to try to sensitize myself to those issues, um, but I can always learn more. One thing I will tell you is that um, I'm uh, organizing our global surgery initiative, uh, and I am housing that underneath the Equity Institute. I, I think that they, uh, because the, the tragic inequity in access to health care is a huge problem, so much so that I wanted to have our global surgical institute housed underneath an overall equity institute so that equity is a through line in everything that we do. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's a, a topic that I love to ponder. I don't, certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. That's great, thank you so much. Did you have another question? Uh, hi. Um, so another question I had was I was wondering if there is any data <clears throat> across like various countries to show like where we stand in the U.S. when it comes to uh, women uh, being involved in neurosurgery. And then I was wondering within the United States, um, <clears throat> how many women um, are of like South Asian descent? That might be, I don't know if there's data on that um, or Asian descent in general or if it's too specific? Um, good question. I'll start with the last one. I, the, I am not aware of any place or group that tracks uh, women neurosurgeons of South, of Asian descent. Um, there is a group uh, a professional affiliation group called the American Association of Southeast Asian Neurosurgeons that would have a sort of back of the envelope I, ideas about that, but I don't think that it is that 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 is tracked by our um, residency programs or our board certification um, entities. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have those specific data. And your first question was? Um, it was uh, if there was any data comparing like uh, women in neurosurgery across various countries. Yeah, that's right, across countries. So there is, but uh, tell me what you make of this. Um, I find it hard to, to, to understand. So there are over a dozen countries in Africa where there are no neurosurgeons, women or men. In Rwanda, there's one woman. In Algeria, 46% of the neurosurgeons are women. And that is a, a Muslim predominant country where you know, they, 
the general understanding might be that it would be harder for women to have scientific professional success. And yet that is one of the most highly represented uh, groups. Um, the, past, the, the immediate past president of the Algerian society was a woman neurosurgeon. The immediate past president of the Moroccan society was a woman. The current president elect of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies is a Moroccan woman. Um, so you have these, these pockets of influence that um, you don't see across regions. I don't, uh, I mean, we could go into a lot of detail having, having spent much of the pandemic talking with fellow woman neurosurgeons about how things are in their country. I have sort of anecdotal reports about why it is thus, you know, in one country versus another. And one of the explanations for why Algeria is so well represented is because they had a terrible civil war in the 60s that fundamentally against France, as you may know, and that kind of fundamentally changed some elements of the way women were educated and women were viewed in society um, that that advanced them in terms of equality in uh, in access to professions, particularly scientific ones. Amazing, thank you. Um, and then I guess the last question I had was, do you have any advice on like what medical students can do to like advocate for representation of women in neurosurgery and women of color in neurosurgery and intersectionality as a whole. Yeah, so I would get involved. So on a, at a campus level, do you at, at Tulane have uh, an AANS student chapter? Uh, so if you have that, I'd start with that because that with that, that allows you to kind of have the weight and heft of an entire organization behind you. So if you have idea, it, it amplifies your your message from the local to the national to the global. So I'd start with your student chapter and you may want to ask to be on one of these committees that I referred to before. The AANS has a diversity, equity and inclusion committee that's very active. So does the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. For that matter, so does the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. And finally, um, the Women in Neurosurgery group has uh, a a website. It's actually a, a site on the AANS website, and there's all kinds of opportunities to get involved with the now 500 some odd women practicing neurosurgery in the United States. Thank you. You bet. Looks like Brandon has a question. Yes, and this would be the last one because we have to end the session at 1 p.m. Okay, thank you. I'll make it quick. Uh, hi, Dr. So thank you for your talk. I'm actually a fifth year neurosurgery resident at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Oh, fantastic. Um, oh, say yeah. hi to my pals there for me. <laughs> I will. Um, and I was a two lane medical student. Yeah. So if that gives yeah. any of you uh, female med students hope. Um, so I consider myself lucky to be at OHSU. We're sort of notorious for matching female students in neurosurgery. You bet. Um, and we have several female faculty as well. So it's a nice support system. But um, there has been subtle criticism over the years that uh, because our former chairman was so adamant about matching women that maybe we um, moved the needle too far and considered uh, certain candidates who were not as well qualified as their male counterpart counterparts in order to um, achieve a higher match rate for women in neurosurgery at our specific institution. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that critique. And if you have any advice for, you know, now in a role where I'm looking at um, match applications and helping recruit and interview applicants, is there any role for um, considering candidates dif differently based on their gender? Right. Well, you're talking about affirmative action or a facilitated in integration. Mm -hmm. And um, here, I, I know very well the, the arguments in this debate, pro and con. Um, here's where I come down on it. I don't think there is 
any role for a less qualified neurosurgeon. I wouldn't want myself to be operated on by them. I wouldn't want someone I love to be operated on by someone who was less able. Uh, so I would not in any way advocate relaxing standards in order to accommodate numbers. It's not the same as a representative legislative assembly, for instance, uh, in Iceland, where they have target numbers. Um, so no, I, I don't believe in uh, in having in, in, in that type of affirmative action. Having said that, there are many ways of looking at and scoring candidates. And it may be that something as simple as a board score or a GPA that are close, I would argue that someone who has a 3.9 versus a three point average is not con considerably better. You have to take the whole person. But if there is general agreement that one candidate uh, overall is better than another, then I would take the best candidates into neurosurgery, whether they are male, female, blue, green, orange, um, whatever. We want the best people. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank very you much, much. Dr. Rousseau. <laughs> Good. You want to wrap so for much, us, everybody. Isabella or Kristen? Sure. I just want to say thank you for sharing the, the history and the trajectory of diversity and in neurosurgery and in other fields around the world and how things are improving um, progressively. That gives a lot, a lot of us hope. Um, and thank you for showing the data that shows that in every single field, no matter where, what you're working in, uh, diversity is a huge strength. Um, and that's something I think everyone needs to hear. So thank you for coming and speaking to us today. Let me just leave with a Madeleine Albright's favorite co quote about this topic, which is, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. I love so that. Thank you. Go forward and help one another. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Amy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.